Good morning. Uh, we're going to talk now about, I'm going to present the, uh, the takes framework. And we will try to create, I will try to, I'll try to demonstrate how we can create a real life project uh, using takes framework. Uh, it's going to be a full hour of coding, I hope, uh, configuration and coding. Uh, there will be no, I think there won't be any questions in the end because we don't have enough time. And I expect you to, I will give a lot of information. I will write code faster and make changes fast. So you are, uh, I would expect you to, if you want like to go into details, to watch it a few times. And everything will be online and this code will be open source. So here's what we're gonna create. It's gonna be, uh, I'm gonna share my screen, uh, all of it, one second. I'll share everything and yeah, the entire screen. So it's good. So I called it, uh, uh, we're gonna call it, sorry. So the name of the app and the name of the, of the project is JR. And I wanna explain what it's gonna be. It's gonna be a small, simple uh, CDN uh, which is going to work like that. Like it's, it's a replacement of, conti of uh, content delivery network, uh, which is going to work like this. So we have to. We will give an ability for users to. Uh, I think you know what the CDN is. It's content delivery network. Like uh, there's Amazon CloudFront or Akamai or Max CDN. There are a number of solutions on the market. Uh, the idea of a CDN is uh, is that uh, we have a content which is located somewhere, for example, I'm going to use my website. So the content is located, for example, images or big files. It's located somewhere here. And the browser is over here. So we don't want the browser to show the content. We don't want the browser to go every time to my real server to get the files. But instead, we want to use a content deliver network, which is CDN, which is located uh, uh, which is which has many endpoints, so-called, which has many servers all over the world where the content is cached. So uh, traditionally, when the browser traditionally is done like this, so people configure um, configure this CDN, they create an account there, and uh, and then this CDN and this and then the CDN servers they basically fetch the content from my server, my from my my website, my my content sources, and. And, and put this into cache and then give it to the browser. We're gonna do it a little bit differently. We're gonna simplify that. So basically when, when the user has something like that on the, on the website, something like that, so the user will have, um, will have this stuff. Let's say you're the user and on your website you have this, you have this image which you want to show. Uh, in this case, the browser will always go to my to my server team.io to to download the logo. Uh, we're gonna replace it. We're gonna put the we're gonna put our server in front of that, which is gonna be called CF, which is for CloudFront. Then the name of the service will be jer.io, and then we're gonna give the the URL in the parameter. How it's gonna technically work? The browser will see this string. The browser, the number one, the, the number will the, the browser will go to cf.jr.io. And then from here, it's gonna be our server, it's gonna be the cloud front endpoint. So the cloud front will check whether the content, whether this uh, this full, whether this uh, whether this one already exists in the cache. If it does, if it exists, it's going to be this, this the line 2A. If it exists, it's going to get it from the cache and return back to the browser. If it doesn't exist, the cloud front will go, the cloud front is configured. I already did that. So the cloud front is configured that way. So it's going to go, number two, it's going to go to jr.io. It's going to be like this. I'm going to call it relay. So it goes to relay.jr.io. This is our product, which we're going to create now in a minute. So it goes number two, this this connection, this this request. It's not going to be HTTP request. It goes to relay.jr.io, providing this entire uh, URL. 
rel here and then our server our service will get will connect to the team io fetch the content return it back and then return it back to the cloud from so for for users it's going to be really easy and free they don't need to configure any cd and they don't need to create any accounts on cloud from on cloud from all they need to do is to change the url in the html so today i have this tomorrow i just put the prefix in there so this is the prefix so I put this prefix in front of my URL, and then boom, I have a CDN. That's pretty pretty convenient solution. Should be, and I don't see anything like that on the market because it's free, first of all, and it's really easy to configure. There is no configuration required. So let's create it right now. So first of all, let's make a project on GitHub. Let's call it Jer. Jer.io. So I'm starting really from scratch. Nothing. So this is the URL. And then we're going to clone it. Sorry. Clone it here. Good time. Uh, and then I, I made some, you know, I made some code already. So we're going to do, uh, we're going to go to, uh, we're going to copy the stuff I made so far, which is going to be, uh, like this. Uh, so I made some code before the seminar. So I'm gonna we're not gonna write everything from scratch. So I will just make I will just copy. Uh, it's gonna be a Java project. So it's take framework. We're gonna we're gonna use the POM XML. We're gonna use the. Uh, let me check. A second. I made some notes before this. So yeah, we need to some file structure. So S, uh, SRC sources main Java uh, main Java IO here. Uh, and then we'll need just one file for now, which is entrance.java in order to start in order to start writing something. So that's the first file we, we need. And then we want to what I'm trying to do first is to to make the application uh, deployable and we want to see it online. So that's why uh, let me check. Yeah, that's right. So that will be probably enough. Entrance.java, and then we make the folder TK. And now we need just, I'm going to show you the beginning of the process, and then we'll make faster, we'll make changes faster. Uh, so I'm saying we need to, to open. So I'm creating a new project in, in IntelliJ. You will, you will see this code online later, so you don't need to. And let me copy content, which I've made already. Mm -hmm. I'm basically making two files. The first one is first one is called entrance, which is the command line, which is the, the, the file for Java to run the application, which is the main file. And it does basically it does basically uh, one thing. It's, it makes an instance of this class uh, CL, CLI stands for command line interface, and it makes an instance of it makes a take. Which is a which is the um, which is the um, the the main core uh, entity in 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 the framework, and it gives the the command line arguments to the to the runner of of a take, 
and then it says start and gives the the object which which informs um, the the machine this this front end when to stop. So this is the main entrance class, and this is going to be application itself. The application itself must implement the take and here we're going to do something really primitive so so this is the main method in each take so each take is a uh, each take is a, uh, is a snapshot of situation on the server so when the, the HTTP request comes in uh, it's going to come to this method and the request will be in this in this object and the take is supposed to do something with this request and return back the response and this take is created only once when the application is uh, is supposed to be created only once when the application is built so when we build the application we'll make an instance of this on the of this take like you see here so we make an instance of uh, of this of this app uh, of the take and it's going to stay with that forever. So this object is made only once, and then we call method starts, and the object lives for for many hours or many days or years. So it's never gonna uh, it's never gonna stop. So what what we do here inside? Let's say we will always return uh, we will always return the text response. Hello world. That's all we do. So we return. And resolve matter. That's right. So we just make an instance of response text. It's just, it's, it's 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 coming from the from the takes uh, framework, and we do hello world. So now our application is ready. So that's all we need just to just to make a, a first simple uh, the, the 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 application to make it run. And now I want to deploy it to Heroku, and I want to see that everything works all together, and I want to be sure that I can run it locally. So this is the first step in creating, I think, in any application. We need to see the skeleton working before we put any functionality on top of that. So this is the, the, the application which works. And now let me show you what we have in the uh, in the in the POM XML in order to run it. So we have the uh, we have the the POM XML. Uh, I created it before. So this is the, the description of everything. Then we're going to use Amazon for DynamoDB for persistence. And this is the dependency for the takes for the framework itself. And then there are many other dependencies, which we'll need later. No need to, to describe them. Some compiler configuration, some integration testing configuration, uh, just testing configuration, uh, deployment, default deployment is skipped. And then we configure. I configure the. Um, we'll discuss it later to build the CSS, and then to build to minify the the CSS, and then to compress uh, XML, XSL, all that stuff. This one is for persistency. Again, we'll discuss it later for DynamoDB because we're going to use the, the persistence layer is going to be DynamoDB, and this is for running locally and seeing the updates. We'll discuss it as, again as well later. And this one is for Heroku. So this one is the profile which which will uh, package uh, package the entire thing together into the jar, which is which is executable locally, which can be executed. So let's try to build this jar and see how it works locally. So it's Maven, Maven 3. It doesn't build because the CSS, the, 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 some resources do not exist. Yeah, so let's add that resources so it doesn't complain. So I had some resources before. So let's just copy them here and make it buildable. SRC, JR, SRC main. Sorry, I didn't copy everything. Uh, this one we need, and this one. Let's just copy now whatever is needed just to make it buildable. Package rule. So we have to we have to get the jar file right now, which is uh, which is uh, executable. So let's take a look at what we have. It's going to be in target folder. Uh, we have this jar.jar. So this thing is 
supposed to be executable if we do it right. To do it right, let's see how it's done on Heroku. Uh, we need this file too for Heroku. This one. Let's see what's in this file. So, oops. So let's see. Okay, we see the content of this file. This is how this jar file is supposed to be executed on Heroku. Java, then, then some configurations, some parameters, then the, the, the class path, which is target jar jar, the, the, the jar we just created, and also the dependencies which are created in the in this, this folder, created by Maven. So Maven just built a list of dependencies and just copied these jar files. You see the list that's over here. All of these jar files are just copied into this folder to make it runnable on Heroku. And then I give the name of the file to run. Then I specify the port, the threads, and something else. So let's copy this and try to run it locally, the application. So for the port, 911, for example, 9000. And here we go. I think it should be it. I think it's running. So let's see. So the application is up and running. We see hello world. It's running this Java. I can stop it. It's not running anymore. When I start it again, it's up. It doesn't show any logs because we didn't configure the logging yet, but probably we don't need it all for, this, for this demonstration. So the application is running. It shows the something. And now let's try to deploy it to Heroku. I already created the Heroku application. I did it like this yesterday. Heroku apps create jar IO. And it said, okay, the application is created. And then I went to Heroku and configured the, the domain names. That's what I did. So now we need to configure the, the deployment script, which will allow us to deploy this stuff to Heroku. I did it again yesterday. I'll just show it to you. This is the, this is the deployment script, deploy.sh, which basically does this. So it, it gets the... Uh, some settings.xml, the secret file, which I keep aside from the project where I keep all the secrets. I mean, some, some configuration parameters, some, some passwords, something else. So I keep it there. So what I do in this script, I basically copy these settings. I add these settings to the repository, I commit it there, and then I make sure that when it's done, it's going to be on the exit, it's going to be removed and uncommitted. And then I push this stuff to Heroku. You can see the script later. But the point is that it should be, we should be able to deploy it right now. And Heroku should start this, uh, should, uh, you see? So we need to first add the, we need to add all of this to GitHub. Git actually. So we just copy Git attributes, Git ignore, and maybe the readme as well. Let's copy as much as possible. And system properties. System properties is just a specification of the Java version. Just contains some properties for Heroku. I set 1.8. Uh, let's see. OK, we have that. Let's add it all. First version. Just push it to GitHub. And now we need to configure. We need to make sure that uh, the Heroku is Mm, the Heroku knows that uh, that this is that this repository. We just need to add the remote for Heroku, and to do that, uh, let me see how I did it yesterday. Uh, that was it. Remote Heroku. So we need to add this stuff. It uh, remote add Heroku like this. I guess. Now it's going to be deployable. No, it's not. Uh, oh, I just committed the settings. So we will have to, to change the passwords afterwards. Uh, so. Mm. 
Yeah, I did it wrong. So I just committed settings XML to to to, to GitHub with the secrets, <laughs> which is wrong. So I think I need to do it differently. I need to uh, git roll it back. Now we have nothing there. Uh, git uh, add. Mm. I think it should go like this. Yeah, so I just overwrite the, uh, the master branch. And now, Jesus, again, settings is here. Sorry. Uh, oops. Uh, <laughs> let's do it again. Yeah, that's right. Good. And master and stuff. Yeah, now we're good. And now let's deploy. So we're pushing the changes now. We're pushing the, the, the entire master branch to Heroku. Heroku remotely is uh, trying to build this stuff in, in, in using the same Maven, well, different Maven, but also Maven uh, build. Uh, the Heroku, as you see here, is using the, the settings we, well, it's using the settings, not our settings, but uh, I think the settings from, yeah, it is using our settings, that's right. It's using the settings files, which we just committed. It doesn't run any tests. It just says clean dependency list for some reason and then install. So it's basically going to build everything locally and then run the jar, which we just did the same way we did it locally. And the, 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 the URL is here. So it's now we are supposed to see hello world on Heroku. We do see it. So it does run on Heroku. And I also configured the domain already so that if we go to the domain, we're going to see it as well. Now the application is working using the takes framework and just returns hello world. So the first step is, I would say, done. And we can go further and create more or less meaningful application, which will do something more uh, interesting. So let's see. Inside the, the, the application, let's say we want to, we want to, uh, we want to see this text only on the certain on the certain URL. So for that, we have uh, we have this take fork, so called, which is gonna is gonna allow us to fork by uh, by, for example, regular expression. So we're gonna say like this, for example, robots .txt is gonna return this this response. This is return new TK fork. What's wrong? So the TK fork, TK stands for the take. So the TK fork is uh, the take, which is also accepting requests when necessary and re returns responses. So in this case, we want our application to we handle different URLs, and let's say for the index page we want to say hello, and for the for the robots.txt we want to say that, and for the uh, let's say I don't know main CSS we want to see something else. So in this so this this fork will 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 check what's coming in in the inside the request, and according to the request, according to the details of the request, it will it will redirect, it will basically dispatch uh, the request to different destinations. The destinations is here. These are the destinations. And uh, these are the, the dispatching instructions. So in order to make it more looking more like real life, I will show you what I've done yesterday to make this like application more realistic. So let's just copy this stuff from uh, from all this Java code. Mm. 
let's copy what I've done. So this is, maybe I can copy everything. So I've created, created a number of files. This, this is everything we need for the application, for this, for this service to run. Uh, and, and this stuff is for persistence layer, for actually the model of some, some stuff we manage. And this is for persistence layer. I'm going to copy it as well, just to make it, this application compilable. And I will now show you how all this stuff stay together. That's basically it. That's, that's the, entire, the entire application is here. So now let's just see what's there. So first of all, so the entrance is not changed. The entrance is still the same. We're not going to do anything here. The entrance is the same, except the, except the, no, it's not exactly the same. Let me copy the entrance I had there. The entrance. So in the entrances, there's something is different that we are supplying the uh, we are supplying the instance of uh, of our base. The base is uh, ev the base is an object which is responsible for um, for all the persistence in the app. So everything we need to know about what's inside, I mean, what's in the database, we're using, I'm using DynamoDB. What's in the database, we just give it here as an instance to the take. So let's see what's in this TK app now. Um, this is the, the constructor. And I'm using this wrapper now, so I'm not making, I'm not in, implementing the take, I'm extending the wrapper. And in the constructor, I'm giving the, the, the instance of this base, and then I'm calling super in order to so so I'm supposed to I'm sup, I'm creating the take over here. So this make method it's a loc it's a private static method which creates a take, and this take is going to be used as a uh, as an it's used as a, as a parameter for the constructor of this wrapper. It's just it's just in order this is done in order to make the code shorter. So here we check first of all we check for the encoding it's not really necessary, and then this is funny code coming in here. Which is which is interesting to see. So basically, we can do what we can do instead of this code. We can do like this. Let's do it like this, and then I'll explain why this what this code is doing. So again, this I'm go, I'm going to another static method again, just to make the code shorter. And this is the code which actually makes the using that that fork which we saw before. So this is the dispatcher. In a, in a more traditional MVC architecture, we have these dispatchers. We have the, uh, the, the, the front controller, which is supposed to dispatch the request or using the dispatcher. Uh, here, is a, the philosophy is different. Uh, there's no dispatchers. There's just a take. So there's a, there a, there a take. We're creating a take, which is accepting requests. And this take is supposed to return responses. And this particular take is, is forking the request. So it's, it's, it's working like a dispatcher, but it's not called a dispatcher. It's just a take. And then it goes to like this. If it's a, if it's a, it, it, and then FK stands for the fork. So if the host, which is, which, if the request is coming for the host, if it's a relay.jr.io, it goes to this class. It dispatches the request to TK relay. And then it goes further. If it's not this host, if it's in just something else, if it's www, then it goes further. So if it's a robot, we go for nothing. If it's the uh, XSL, it matches this regular expression, we go for, uh, we'll see later what it is. So we're just getting the content from, uh, from uh, getting the content from class pass or from the, uh, from the file. And if it's CSS, Again, if it matches this pattern, the request is matching the pattern, then it goes something else. If it matches the images, then it goes somewhere else. If it's uh, the images, the SVG, then it goes somewhere else and returns with this type. And then if it's, uh, if it's a home page, then we see TK index. If, it's the, if the user is, is authenticated instead, we're gonna, we're gonna be enabling the authentication with the GitHub. If the user is authenticated, then it's going to be a, a secure page so that nobody else can access this page. And then we go for, uh, again, we are forking. So if, if it's slash domains, we're going to see all the domains for the user. If it add, we're going to be able to add a domain. If it's delete, we're going to be able to delete the domain. 
So as you see, it's, it's one object. It's one object created here. There's, not, there's no procedural code in here. We just declare our intention. We just declare what needs to be done. We, we, we composing, uh, we're composing this uh, objects one into another. And then the logic is encapsulated in the object in, in this in this class in TK fork for example or fork host. So the class is quite quite short. You can see that this TK fork implementation is quite easy. easy. That's that's everything which is inside. Now I'm inside the the takes framework. It's not my code. It's coming from the framework. So it's quite easy. It's just one method which basically goes through all the forks which are provided. It tries to get it tries to root the request there. It's try to to ask the fork can you do something with the request. If there is some response, then this is the response we're looking for. If none of the if none of the forks gave nothing, then we just return. We just throw an exception with the HTTP not found. That's all the code which is inside the the fork. Or you can look at the FK regex, for example. It's also quite quite short. So this is the code which is which is routing the by regular expression. So we're checking the pass. What's in the request? Do some manipulations with that. If we match that, we re we return the uh, we return the response. So these takes classes are quite small. Authenticated, for example, again, it's quite quite small. So we check what's the identity, checking the request, trying to find out whether there is identity in the cookie. If there is no identity, we ret we return empty. If there is an identity, then we return something from the encapsulated take. So they're all composable decorator. That's what I'm getting at. So all of this, all of this small classes and, and, and small objects which we're creating here, they they stay one into another and they are they're composing one another. And in the end, we can look at our implementation, for example, TK index. You can see how small it is. So this is the page basically which is which is rendering the index page of the site. So when the request comes in, we create this, this instance of a page, I'll, I'll show it to you right now, where we specify what XSL should be used and the request. So that's, that's our home page. That's the implementation of the home page. Or for example, let's look at, let's look at the, of the add uh, take. So this is what happens when we, somebody hits the button and says, add me, that register a new domain here. So registering a new domain, first of all, we get the name of what's provided in the form. So this is the like supplementary class which, which gets the information from the request, if, if it's a form. And then it gets the parameter by the name, and then it gets it, like gets the parameter, then it goes to the base, which is encapsulated here. So the bases are actually persistence. So it gets the user by the username, and then it adds the new domain to the user. And then it returns the, the returns the response, which says domain has been added, and the response has the destination, the destination point. So what I'm saying is that all these classes are quite small, and you will be able to see them later yourself. And now let's see, uh, let's see, let me show you. I wanted to show you something. Uh, yeah, I want to show how the rendering works. So this is basically the dispatching. And now the question is how to actually we render the page. So we can run right now this whole thing because it's already you know ready. And I can build it uh, locally again. Just package it. And we will be able to run it now. And you will see how it looks visually. And then I will show you how it's I mean, how I've done it internally. Okay, now it's ready. And we need to, let me find an instruction we've done before to run it locally. Yeah, that's the way. So I exited it locally and I can see what's in there. Yeah, boom. So we have the, the front page of the application which explains what it does. Um, it says it has some text, it has some design, uh, the logging button, the logo. And some text. So how it's done? How this 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 stuff is being rendered? If the code, so now it's just the home page. So this is the URL. And in how it works, it works in here. That's the class which does that. So the class basically creates the instance of RS page. RS stands for response. So this class RS page I created. That's mine. 
and it does a number of uh, it does basically it composes it also quite it also quite big so there are basically two big classes this is the app TK app which which is quite quite long because it's it's the entire application in the real application this class may be really long so it may have because it's basically it consists only of calling the new new and everywhere new so it's basically making making objects so it's it's a class which constructs a huge number of other classes and this one also it's quite big because it constructs a page and i'm using xsl and xml for rendering the the front end and the idea here is that the response we're returning uh, is consists of it, it's supposed to be XML. So the XML is returned, and then the XSL style sheet is attached to the XML response. <clears throat> so when it goes out, you can see this is the page, and if you see the source of this page, then on the source you see that it's not it's not HTML, it's XML actually. So our server returns XML, XML file, and there is an attached style sheet. So there is a style sheet which, is, which informs Chrome, the browser, how to convert this XML into the, into the page we see here. And this is, I think, the approach which is really effective and, and should be used as much as possible, even though it's not really popular. But I really use it everywhere because this 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 page is much cleaner than the HTML page you can create. So for development and for design and for testing and for everything, uh, looking at this stuff is much more comfortable than looking at the HTML, where data data um, is mixed with the formatting with the style. So our server returns XML and attaches the XSL to it. So the, the work, the job of rendering everything now uh, stays on the shoulders of the browser of Chrome. So the question now is how do we build this XML page? To build the XML page, we're using this uh, mechanism which is called Xambly. The Xambly is a language, this imper imperative uh, language for building XML and manipulating XML. So basically the page here, the response we're getting here is, uh, is built as a as a collection of instructions of how XML should be built, and all these small classes are uh, again composing, staying one into one inside another, and helping us to uh, to put elements into this XML document. So this is XML document. So this one, for example, uh, this element is created by this class. And this one, for example, is created by this one. So you can look inside. I'm going into the, 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 the framework. So this, you see how this date is created. First of all, we render this, this time and date. We set the time zone. And then we create one, we create one di directive. This one directive is attribute. So set attribute to the name date, which is by default date. And then set it to format. So that's it. So this is the this is the class which uh, creates the date attribute. So this one, for example, SLA, which is the <clears throat> which is the load average on the server. You see, if I re you load the page, it keeps changing. Number. It's dynamically. It's being done. It's just it just get on the fly from the from the from the machine I'm running, and this one is done by this class SLA. SS, SLA. Again, this is how it's done. It goes to some management factory, whatever gets system load average. So the point is that we here build a response as a as a composition of micro uh, of micro blocks of of assembly instructions, and then in the end, this all this set of assembly instructions uh, is being converted to XML. When it flies out of a server. <clears throat> so here, when I'm saying index page, so this is the TK index. When this is XSL index dot XSL, then basically what this class does, RS page, it creates an 
almost empty uh, XML document, and then it attaches the, the XSL to it. And the XSL is here, for example. This is index XSL, which is not too long. So that's it. That's everything we need here. And that's the, the that's the, the, the text you see over there. That's the text. This is the text in the index XSL. So the RS page again generates a collection of it, it generates it combines together objects which are capable of producing assembly instructions. They all stay together and and uh, they all know how to combine each other into the the full page. And then when the page is ready, it goes out in XML format uh, while the XSL is attached to it. So the XSL is a static resource for us, and the XML is generated on the fly. And now let's see how we deal with the with the static resources. I do understand that it's a lot of information for you, but I don't expect you to understand everything right away. But I I think you will get back to this and, and see it again as files index layout domains because basically we have two pages the index page and the domains page and the layout is a common template for them I can show you this layout template so the layout basically has the the HTML the HTML with the, 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 the icon the style sheet and everything and then this formatting section header navigation everything and it calls the layout calls the uh, calls the templates from the from the specific uh, style sheets. So the index includes a layout, and then layout starts running, and layout is is calling uh, this template and this template where it's necessary. That's how XSL works. Well, that's how it's applied here. That's how I I configured it here. Um, what else? Yeah. So the question is how we how we render this static resources because if you look in there, if you go in here and say uh, XSL uh, layout XSL, you're gonna see it here. It is rendered by the server in the in the format where it's in the format of how it's stored there, but not exactly. The format is not exactly the same. Look at this text. Look at this layout page, and look at this one. You see that this one is more, uh, uh, you know, it's the way I designed it. And this one is clean. This one, for example, stays in one line, while in my code there are two lines. And there is no comment here. I have a comment, but in production there is no comment. So what is done here, how it's done, is that we keep these files uh, in, in this folder, source main XSL, and then, uh, there is a plugin in Maven which is configured to, yeah, here it is. The profile is called resources. And then there is a plugin here which takes this XSL file, compresses it, and then stores into, so it gets them from this folder and stores them into XSL folder in the output directory. So let's see exactly where it's stored. So it's getting it from here. Uh, uh, so it's getting them from resources, uh, sorry, from here, src source main XSL, and packaging, well, optim compressing them, removing the content, uh, the comments, and everything, and store them here in classes. Classes XSL. So they become real resources like, like class files, for example. So we keep here class file files as well. So the class file stay here, and XSL will be also on the class path. So the static resource will be available on the class path, and that's how we will be able to find them. That's how the takes will be able to find them. So, and the same happens with the CSS. The CSS stays here. I'm using SAS, 
So it's not like, it's not just this, just the CSS, it's, it's SAS, so it means compilation. So it will be compiled and stored here. So this is the, the CSS, which is compressed and, and everything. While here is the source in the SAS format. Uh, what else? The images as well. So we have images inside the resources, but now the images are not being compressed because they're stay already in the resources directory. So the Maven just copies them, you know, without any changes. So we have two images, the logo and logo. And uh, what else do we have here in meta? Yeah, this one is for logging, uh, which will log everything using log4j, log everything to, uh, to console and, and wherever we need that. What else? And then we have classes. Classes are compiled. This is our class path. That's exactly what goes into jar. All this is packaged, all these classes, and it goes into jar. That's the content of a on-fly, unzipped content of, of the jar. Uh, and now the question is, how do we manage the persistence? How the persistence works, I think works. I think that's the last thing to discuss, and then I will let you go. So the persistence is, uh, uh, the question is how to, yeah, so we make an instance of the app, and we give here into the app, we provide uh, a base, which is, look at this, this is my model. So this is my model. So in the model, I have three interfaces. The first one is called base, which is, uh, which is an entry point to, to everything which I have in storage. So I'm able to get a user from there. I'm able to see the domains from there. And then the domain is also an interface and there's a user in the interface. So we have three interfaces. And then we have the implementation of these interfaces, the implementation on DynamoDB. So we have Dynamo, DY stands for the Dynamo, the prefix. So we have Dynamo base. So the Dynamo base, for example, this one is the real code. Well, this one is the code which goes to DynamoDB and, uh, well, makes us a query there returning some, some items. This one, say, it creates a new domain name, a new domain, registers a new domain. And this one is... Uh, loads, you know, deletes the domain, for example. So all this stuff is like the, all these three, well, four classes is the implementation of, of this model. Pay attention that DY base is the only public class in this package. The only one. So to get access, sorry, to get access to, uh, to this real storage, we need to make an instance of die base, and we can't make an instance of, oopsie, it should be like this. So we can't make an instance of dy domain, and we can make an, make an instance of dy user. Nobody needs that. Nobody needs that. So all we need is just create an instance of the base, and then use this base through, I mean, use this, um, uh, use the objects that the base provides for us. And here in the entrance, we, we do exactly what I just said. We create an instance of this of this dynamo base and then the application tk app will use will pass this base everywhere where it's needed look at this for example when we need to see the full list of domains we give this base to the tape we want to add new domain we give the base here we want to delete we give the base so basically the, the persistence that the object which uh which is for persistence we keep sending it through all the i mean we 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 encapsulate it in each take where it needed, where it's needed. For example, here, to add a new domain, we give this, we encapsulate this base over here. So we give it to the constructor and it's being encapsulated. And then when the, the actual operation is, is being done, then we're using this base, getting the user out of it and registering a new domain. So the persistence, which is this is this is how it's different from this uh, dependency injection frameworks, where where in, in in for example in Spring you would say something like that, or in many other frameworks. So you would expect this base to be injected from somewhere. In this case, it's not like that. Nobody is. It's, it's not coming from some unknown source. We can easily see where it's coming from because there's only one place in this entire application where this particular class is being instantiated. Nowhere else. 
this TKA domains is instantiated. Nobody else is doing that. Not the framework. The framework is not doing that. The framework doesn't know about TK domains. So these TK domains is created, the instance of it is created only here and only once for the entire application. And the persistence layer is encapsulated there. So we don't need this dependency injection at all. We, we basically do, we don't need the containers or we don't need any dependency injection layer running on the background and injecting some persistence anywhere. Because we, we, provide, the we provide the persistence layer, we encapsulate it into the, into the object. Here, here, and here, when we need it. And that's, that becomes really easy and fast for, easy for, for testing and easy for, uh, uh, for, uh, for, I mean, for design, for everything. So let me show that. That's that, that's what I wanted to say about persistence, and just a few words about testing as well because that's important. So let's create a unit test for it. We have a few minutes more, so we need to create a unit test, and then we'll just deploy this stuff to uh, to Heroku, and we'll see how it works. I mean, full of it. So this is main test. So now I think we have everything is needed there. And we can deploy it to production and see how it works. So for the testing, uh, let's see like this. So um, I don't I see any tests. Mm -hmm, that's strange. Anyway. So here's the simple test which will prove that our application works. Let's take a look. We just want to render the home page here. So first of all, we create a new instance of the TK app. So we create the entire app in just one line for a unit test. And we provide a fake instance of a base. Because we can't provide the DynamoDB base here. It's a unit test. We don't want to go to the, to the DynamoDB here. We just, we just created a fake implementation of the base. Let's see what it, what's inside. Uh, I don't know what's wrong in here, why it doesn't understand. Anyway, so if you go into FK base, then you see that the, all the classes are implemented quite simply. When there is a list of domains is required, we just return a single tone of one fake domain. If it's a user required, we just return a fake user. So it's not a real base, it's just a fake base, which is good enough for the testing purposes. So we create a take, which is the entire app for us. And then, and then we, uh, I can't understand why it doesn't work. Uh, now it doesn't see J unit. Uh, that's strange. I need to need to kill everything here. Again. No. Good one, yes. So it looks like looks like I won't be able to uh oops, now we lost everything. Uh Wait a second. So we need to we need to run a test to see how it works in uh, how it works for the testing purposes. 
think we should be able to do it now. Yes. Uh, so here's the test which will, which will demonstrate how the application can be can be tested. So first of all, we make an instance of the application, and then we say, take act. So we are like simulating the real request from a real browser, and then we make an instance of this request. So we're saying, we're, we're, it's just again a number of decorators, so it's a fake request, and then with the header. So we're saying, we accept text XML, so give us back the text XML. And then we wrap it up with the, with the RS print, which is again a class which uh, the, you remember the response is coming from here, so the response is being printed. So we print the entire body of the entire response, and then we're saying that this response must have uh, this this path. So we can run it now, right here, and you will see that it passes. So it's green. And to show you what's inside, let's say let's make some mistake here and run it again. So you will see that it's giving us the response here which is almost exactly the same to what we see in the web. Here. This is the response we're getting from production. From, from production. This one in the unit test. So in the, the beauty of this framework here is that we can really simulate, we can, in the test, we are getting exactly the same uh, what we have in production. And we're, we're, we're doing very small, very, very little effort for that. We just made uh, a fake base you know, because we don't need the real to, to work with the real uh, persistence. And we are uh, simulating the, the request, uh, giving some parameters for it. And then, boom, it just works. So we're running out of time. So let's try to deploy this stuff to Heroku. Uh, uh, wait a second. Why the okay? Now uh, it's at so let's say it's clean build. We push it to GitHub now and deploying to, to Heroku. While it's working, let me show you. Uh, let me show you one thing which I, which I mentioned but didn't show. So here's the funny thing. I mean, it, it probably looks to you a little bit confusing, but if you get closer to the to the philosophy of the framework and the philosophy of composing of composable decorators and, and an object oriented uh, way of designing things, you will see that. This one, actually, if I would have space, I would, I would put it like this. You see? It's a ladder of constructors, constructors, and constructors. But yeah, but because you know, there is not so much space on the right side, that's why we use the static method. So what's happening here? So this class, we could do it, we can do it just like that. But then we need some extra functionality on top of the on top of, of the of the take created there. So we need, for example, authentication, or we need a, a fallback. So if something goes wrong, we don't want to show the we don't want to to show the Heroku default page when something goes wrong. We want to show a, a more or less good looking uh, uh, a fallback page. And then we want, for example, to, to compress the content. So when the content is coming from the server, it is comp compressed. But this compression is done by this decorator. So when the compression is required, we just, make, we just wrap our take in this, in the, in, in this JZIP decorator, and boom, the content is, 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 uh, <coughs> is encrypted, is, uh, sorry, is uh, compressed. And then we want this measured, which means uh, this one uh, checks how much time the execution of this one took and it adds some headers to the to the response with the information about that. This one is the the version information, etc., etc. So you can you can wrap your take into many many other takes, 
And every time you want some extra functionality, you just create a decorator which decorates the, which wraps the, uh, the take into more and more and adding more and more functionality. Uh, so let's take a look whether it's on the Heroku already. Let's see. Should be there, right? Let's see the folks. Yeah, we have. So it is deployed to Heroku. I'm already logged in. We have a list of domains. So there's a list of domains. There's something wrong with my internet, I guess. Yeah. So it's a list of domains. I can add one more domain, test, whatever. There's no check right now. Uh, test again. I, I'm not checking the format now. Can delete the domain name, can delete it here. And this is the front end page. And this functionality actually works. You can try it yourself. Uh, uh, yeah, so I just stopped, stopped sharing. Um, I think I gave you a lot of information. You can look at this project uh, online and GitHub and see how it's, how it's designed. I, I've spent basically not an hour to do that, but I spent, I think, three hours yesterday to make all this working. Well, I've had some, I've had some uh, previous uh, The beauty of the takes framework, I can summarize that. The beauty of the framework and uh, comparing to, to other frameworks like Spring or Play Framework or others is that it's, well, it, it may be not a benefit for you directly, but it will be if you, if you start, you know, if you get used to that and start loving that. Uh, the first of all, it's, I think it's pure object oriented. So there is no static methods. There is no this dependent change action cross-cutting concepts where data or objects are coming from uh, unknown sources. Uh, it's it's everything like you like you saw. Everything is basically a, a composition of objects, a composition of of classes which make these objects, and and then uh, classes are smaller, way smaller. Uh, classes are way more testable because they don't depend on anything. They don't have any dependencies, like each class stays by its own. So if there is, if there is a persistence there, if the persistence is important, then we just encapsulate the persistence. It's not coming from anywhere, from somewhere else, and then we need to basically to run the entire framework, to, to run the entire application to test one feature, one functionality. We can test them iso in an isolated way. Uh, all these classes, all these takes are, are, are really isolated. And the, the testability is, is high. Uh, performance is, I'm not sure the performance is the benefit because I didn't test, like I didn't do the, a lot of testing on that, but um, I believe it should be faster because the, the amount of code in the framework is quite small. It's a lightweight framework. <clears throat> and it's easy to extend. So it's easy to extend, it's easy to add your own functionality, it's easy to create your own classes. Because the design is quite simple. Basically, the takes framework is all about three interfaces, request, response, and take. That's all you need to, 
to build the application. In the end, I want to show you the book, which, uh, which I just published uh, two weeks ago. It says Elegant Objects, and it, it summarizes all the ideas which um, that, that the takes framework implements, practically implements the ideas which I, uh, which I wrote about in the book. So I would suggest you to buy a book and start using the framework. And check the project, which is on GitHub. You can check the source code. It's already there. Check it out. It's live. It's working. So if you have ideas, suggestions, it's not finished. It's just three hours, but it's already an applic it's already a, uh, it's already a service which you can use in your projects. And, and I'm, I'll start using it myself, too. So try it. Give me your feedback. Thanks for listening. See you next month, the first Wednesday of a month, 11 a.m. Pacific time. Bye-bye.